Okay, we are on the air live. Hi, my name is Rich Harrington from Photofocus.com, and I'd like to welcome you to this Hangout. Joining me is my co-host, Skip Cohen. Skip, how you doing? Hey, Rich. I'm doing great. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. And uh, Skip, we've got a, a great guest. You actually know Matthew Jordan-Smith much better, but he's got a great project and an ethic to talk to us about today. Skip, why don't you do the quick introduction? The quick introduction? All right. It's hard to do a quick one with this guy. Um, <laughs> For those of you that haven't been to a convention where Matthew is speaking, next time you are, run, don't walk to get a seat. He is a great um, writer, speaker, teacher, photographer, artist. Um, he is definitely one of the leading uh, fashion, beauty, editorial photographers. He's been on America's Top Model n many times. Uh, he's just a, a great motivator, and most important of all, he happens to be a good buddy. Um, so we're really glad to get Matthew to stand still today. He's involved in a very, very cool project that we're going to talk about today, uh, Future Presidents, and I'm going to turn it over. Matthew, welcome. Technology's on our side, so you should be online now. I yep. love that. How are you guys doing? It's good, good. to be here. Happy uh, happy Monday morning. It's, it's now like uh, noon here in L.A., so I know you guys on the West Coast, are, on the East Coast, are uh, three hours ahead of me and toward the end of your day, but it's kind of like uh, starting here for me. <laughs> well, well, I want to I want to share with everybody. My my phone rang. I'm on the East Coast, and my phone rang at around I don't know 7:30 this morning, and it was Matthew, um, who was still working from last night. So it might be morning on the West Coast, <laughs> but Matthew's fallen into that wonderful trap we all get into now and then, where you're so involved in a project that you can't let it go. It consumes you. Well, that's a that's a good thing, though. So, and actually, what, before we get started, you've recently worked on a, a very personal project that's really caught the attention of a lot of folks. Matthew, why don't you tell us a little bit about your most recent personal project, and then that'll serve as a good starting ground for the discussion about having personal projects. Sounds good. I've been working on this project for the last, well, now two and a half years. It's called Future American President, and. For the project, I went to every state in America and photographed children from 100 families. It was a huge undertaking, but I can't tell you, I, I, I feel so alive and so amazing working on this project because it's, it's at the core of my being, because it's, uh, it's how I got started in photography. As, as a kid, I read this book by Gordon Parks, and this book... It gave me it gave me focus. It it was a book called A Choice of Weapons, and for the first time in my life, it made me see that you could do photography as a career and not just a hobby. Because before, in my mind, as a kid growing up, I saw photography as a hobby, and so did my family. But that book turned everything around. It was like my aha moment, and I'm trying to make aha moments for kids all over America, and that's really the the, the force behind this new project, Future American President. It's a, a project of planting the seed in kids all over America to believe, to really believe, that they can do anything in their life. So even becoming a future American president. So my idea was to go around, find strangers, and ask them if I can photograph their child as a future president. And it sounds crazy, but... I was told no less than 10 times all over the country. You know, I'm a pretty big black guy and I'm going around to strangers and I'm, I'm asking them, can I photograph their, their treasures, their children, and do short interviews. And it's been an amazing project. I've now finished the project. And what really bugged me doing the project was that I couldn't put more children in the book. It really bugged me. Um, my wife was with me all along the way as we went to, from state to state and finding families. But as we found families, a weird thing happened. They started referring other people to us, their neighbors, their friends, their people at church. And we had to sadly turn them down because I couldn't put a billion people in the book. But as we were driving from state to state, one morning I had this aha moment again. I had this idea and it was a way to put every family in the book. So I told my wife my idea, and she said, I love that. 
so I, I kept it under wraps for a long time, and uh, I'm just starting to announce it. I want to announce it here today. As a matter of fact, I'm announcing it today and doing a launch of an Indiegogo project, which launched two hours ago. So as I went around photographing families, I had to think about the name of my project. The, the book is called Future American, Pro uh, Future American President, 50 States, 100 Families, Infinite Dreams, because I've photographed 100 families or children from 100 families. But in reality, I've only photographed children from 99 families. I've been saving that last spot so that every parent in America can put their child in the book. Actually, not only just in the book, but on the cover of the book. That's, that's a very made cool it idea. Where we can... That's Thank a very you. cool idea. I Thank mean, I you. think it's, it's going to be potentially inspirational to those children to realize that anything is possible. I mean, we certainly have seen a huge shift in, you know, from when I was a kid to today to when you look at who's being considered as presidential candidates or who is the president, that, you know, we've definitely seen a shift in, you know, what's possible. I mean, theoretically, that's, anything should be possible, but it all starts with people believing that it's possible. That's the beginning. That's the beginning. And children believe with their whole heart that anything's possible. So if you can plant that seed early that there are unlimited possibilities, they believe it, and they grow up with that in their heart. And that's the, the idea behind this project. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Skip, why don't you talk a little bit about the, today's topic for today of personal projects. And I think that Matthew Jordan Smith's personal project is an excellent one. I want to revisit that because that will give us some, some starting points. But how about why do photographers need personal projects, Skip? Yeah, in fact, um, Matthew and I have had a lot of conversations about this, and there are there are a number of photographers that have talked in their workshops about the importance of special projects. And the reason that a special project is so important, and hang out with Matthew for probably the last, I don't know, seven, eight years, maybe a little bit longer. Longer, um, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's just been it's been so much fun because Matthew's always had some special project that he was doing, not not necessarily at the level of of the new book, but at a level that kept him excited. In fact, that that print behind him right now um, is from another oh, right. right. From that's another true. yeah, that's another that was another project. <laughs> the point is that that as photographers and and I get caught in it too everybody realizes at this point that you know I'm the low-tech poster child of the photo industry I am not a professional photographer but what keeps us all motivated is being able to do and focus our energy on things that that we love about this industry and a special project let's let's use a good example you're you're an underclass photographer and all day long you're shooting underclass kids which most of us tend to think as one of the most challenging specialties to do there's not a lot of room for creativity you've got one kid after another after another after another but your heart might be in something like landscape photography well just because underclass photography pays the bills and the mortgage doesn't mean that you can't continue to chase those dreams and continue to work on projects it might become a book it could become a gallery opening uh, most important of all yeah most important of all it's just something that keeps you motivated and focused and it keeps you enjoying um, the whole reason you got into photography in the first place and for those of you that are underclass photographers I don't mean to pick on you but I think all of us have got an incredible amount of respect for some of the specialties in photography that don't let you demonstrate um, some of your skill set as much as it does demonstrate an incredible amount of patience. But that's where special projects become so important because they help keep you focused on what it is you fell in love with photography in the first place, why you became an artist. Yes, yes it does. So Matthew, why don't you talk about how you come up with ideas for special projects and as well as what do they do for you as far as recharging creativity? Well, they are they are definitely a recharge for me. It's funny, I, I feel like all my projects have found me versus uh, me looking for them. It's uh, 
I think a special project should really mean something for you. It should be uh, a calling, almost, as it were. Um, with the, the project in the back, it was a project that fell into my lap. I uh, discovered this way of shooting. I shoot all of that on film. Um, as a matter of fact, I can't shoot it on digital. It, it doesn't translate that same way. Um, it, it fell into my lap by mistake almost. I discovered it by playing around, experimenting, and found this way of shooting, and I loved it. With my current personal project, um, that one also appealed to me because of my roots as a photographer. I know how important it is to have um, to be inspired by something. And I, I always think back to about Gordon Parks and his book and how it's influenced my life. And I see children sometimes who are struggling and trying to figure out, you know, or even adults, trying to figure out their, their, their course and what they want to do with their life. And it starts as a kid. And if I can in some way plant a seed that uh, was implanted in me and other people, it makes you feel good. I'm using photography as a tool. And that tool helps me show the world how, what I feel uh, and what I enjoy. I love doing a big job where I'm shooting a, a big celebrity or a big campaign, and, but I can't say it excites me the same way as my personal projects. And what I've learned over the years is that all of my personal projects always lead to so much more beyond my wildest dreams. As long as you, you're doing something that's, that's deep inside of you, that inspires you from within, it shows. People see that in the work. You probably won't see it, but everybody who sees the work, they will see it. And more importantly, they'll feel it. And that changes everything. Well, so down this path, it seems like as a professional, we're often feeling the pressure to you know, do what we love but at the same time, make a living. We, we all have different pressures on us, whether it's to perform for the client, to, to make the mortgage payment, to get the things out there that we're good at. You know, and naturally, things you're passionate about often tend to be things you're better at. And so because of that, you may find yourself rolling that more and more into your job or your gig or what you push on clients. Do either of you ever hold back an area of photography or you know, do you sit on a special project for a long time and you know, have you ever done a project that's purely for you and you don't even share it with others? Oh boy, have I ever. So here's a great story about that. Um, the inch behind you, behind me actually, is a, a project I've been shooting well now for 10 years. I didn't show it for at least six, seven years. Uh, I have thousands of these images, and uh, this is a small one behind me, but these images wrap around and can go on a wall for 20, 30 feet. They're huge. Well, friends who knew I was doing said, you got to start showing this stuff, Matthew. So I, I start, decided to start showing it, and I spoke about it at a convention in New York. Uh, it'll be two years this fall. And in the audience was a gentleman who saw the images, came up to me afterwards. He couldn't speak English, but his associate could. And they said they wanted to take me to dinner, they want to talk about my images that they saw in the show. I ended up going to the show, uh, to the dinner, and uh, ended up being hired by this gentleman to go to China and photograph 75 actors and directors. It was my biggest job of the year last year. All because I finally decided to show the work. You never know what's out there. Well, that's very cool. So, but at the same time, when you were creating it, you didn't set out and say, "Oh, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to put this in my portfolio, and I'm going to market this as a new service." You just simply said, "This is cool. I like this." Right? Absolutely. And I still haven't marketed it. It's still something that's very close to my heart, and I love the work. And I think maybe two people have seen most of the work. I've probably shown twenty of the thousands of the images I have. I probably showed maybe twenty. Very cool, very cool. Skip, what's your take on this? You know, you've, um, you've coached I, a lot of photographers. Yeah, I, I love the idea of special projects. I don't think they have to have any purpose um, whatsoever initially, just like Matthew talked about. It's something he started doing. In fact, years ago, I was at an exhibit at RIT, and Elaine O'Neill, who at that time, I believe, was 
um, dean of the photographic school or whatever the title was, she had photographed her daughter. I don't remember if it was once a day or once a week at the same window at the same time. And now this kid was a teenager and she had this exhibit of images up and it was the most amazing thing to be able to look at the exhibit where she had literally thousands of images and it was all about her daughter and her daughter growing up and changing and to be able to look at them in one massive body of work <laughs> was such an incredible thing to see and she had no idea I don't believe that she honestly thought in the beginning okay this is what I'm gonna do with this someday but a lot of times these projects to me the most important thing is that it keeps photographers on that creative edge whatever it is they've decided to photograph uh, again it could be I mentioned landscape photography before it could be just building um, your own personal gallery of some of your most favorite images I have things most of somehow my life has evolved into a lot of writing I have tons of things that have never been that have been published on a blog that I haven't written about in any of the books that I've done with some other photographers but they're sitting there and every now and then I go back and what's interesting is that when you're doing a special a special project for a length of time it also gives you an, an opportunity to go back and look at what your skill set or what your mindset was at that time and it's a very exciting thing to be able to go back I mean lo I love being able to go back and read something that I wrote about that I was feeling um, about something two years ago or five years ago and that gives me more energy and a different creative spirit going forward and I see that so often with photographers who will go back and they started this idea of, of photographing something someone um, doing something interesting and they don't know what they're gonna do with it but it also becomes a reference manual for their own growth and the way they're looking at the world and the way they look at things through their camera so I love special projects because I think they help keep photographers fresh it could be that you're just going to you're you're going to photograph in a certain way each time you're going to try something that you don't normally try that breaks the routine and I think it's a great way to stimulate creativity and you don't have to have yeah you don't have to have a, a purpose for it or an outlet or a gallery or a book project in mind it's got to be something that starts out for your own enjoyment organically I absolutely agree yeah with them. yeah it's our, it is all or it couldn't be more organic well let's talk about some you know just to help people who are maybe feeling a bit stumped because this is a new concept to a lot of folks so you know I'll, maybe we could each share some some individual ones that we've tried you know for me one of the things that I often dally with is really long exposures and double exposures and, and blending images together I, I like to uh, essentially break the camera and just you know try making as long of exposure as I can try shooting light and energy and just going for the feeling that it creates and I'll do this with cameras ranging from you know pocket point and shoots and uh, you know with you know an action cameras all the way up to pro cameras and screw on 3ND filters so I can make really long exposures in bulb mode um, it's just a lot of fun and I, I have nothing to do with these other than these invariably end up as uh, desktop patterns on my computer sometimes or as backgrounds that I use in presentations and people's oh that's really interesting and I'm like okay you know like it's just it's for me but usually people don't see it or they you know it's not like I'm putting it out there uh, although in some cases sometimes it's a photography I'll do with my son you know he actually enjoys it because it's something that it doesn't matter we're not going for technical perfection and so it's almost like reverse light painting it's taking the camera and instead of moving a light source really slow we're moving the camera around slowly into different objects and it just creates beautiful abstract things that the only reason why I'm doing it is because it makes me feel good so. I know that feeling same I'm on the same page with that absolutely so how about something you've tried, Matthew? That's just you know, do you have one that maybe give people an idea and you know how they could jumpstart or uh, you know if they're feeling a bit struggled, you know, could it just be you know give yourself a random assignment, flip open a magazine and drop your finger on a word and see what you land on? Yeah, absolutely. I uh, I worked on this project uh, that Sony sponsored. Uh, I guess this is like maybe two, three years ago. Uh, 
and it was very cool. They they found 50 uh, photo students around the country, East Coast, West Coast, and they had uh, three photographers go in and spend time with them doing uh, photo walks. And it was so cool because we gave them all this assignment, and it was the assignment was capture the you know the moment of now. If you had to show you know 2014 in images, how would, what would that look like you know 20 years from now? So each person went out with their own idea of shooting the the you know the image of now, whatever that is. And uh, some people felt like, oh well, I don't know what to do, and I'm like, well you know, pick go out and just shoot you know things that are relevant to today that are the color red only shoot that today or go out and just shoot people on cell phones and all these different things but give yourself a focus just don't go out and just shoot but go out with a theme and from that a lot of kids actually stumbled upon not only that theme for the moment but their theme for the year or for a, for a show Help them dig deep and find out what made them come alive, what they feel they love in photography. And I love that even now. Going out, you know, I don't really shoot street photography, but I do love that when I'm away. I was in Beijing, China like a month ago, and I had that in my mind as I'm walking around the streets. I got to have a focus and just shoot that one thing. Focus on one thing. Don't try to shoot everything. And it'll, it will give you hyper focus into discovering something really, really beautiful. And spend a week doing that. Go out one day and shoot just people on a phone or just the color red or just, you know, I don't know, people in black. Just find one thing to focus on and just shoot that for a day or for a week or for a month and you'll have an amazing project. Well, it may sound silly, but sometimes I use my smartphone for this more so because if, if there's the limitations are removed... That's always on me. It's always charged. It's not, you know, it's not in a suitcase. So even if I'm flying, I have it. And so, one simple one that I try is that every time I travel, invariably I end up in parking garages, and I look when I park for something interesting as soon as I get out of the car. And I've got a whole series of numbers at dramatic angles, but every once in a while something unusual will pop up or a strange sign or an interesting bumper sticker and it just reminds me and even just putting you know what started as collecting my parking number so I could find my car has become this incredibly interesting collection of urban typography and when I look at these all side by side I'm amazed at how different the fonts are and then every once in a while there's just hilarious things you'll find like uh, two-hour parking limit misspelled and then when I came back a month later it was all blacktopped over in the entire garage and fixed in every single parking spot and I'd love to know the story there of the before and after but <laughs> you know, just this little trivial thing that most people never pay attention to and it's silly but when I put them all together it's interesting and I could just see all of this variety and I could see things around the world and how people do things differently by narrowing my focus to such a small trivial moment and you know I don't think people should go out and take <coughs> necessarily a picture of their dinner every day but you know sometimes your cell phone is always with you and it opens up interesting ideas it really is it really does uh, it's funny I I have all these projects in my mind that I work on from time to time uh, sometimes they're long-term projects sometimes they just me shooting because I love these things I'm back and forth between New York and LA and they're you know very different in a lot of ways so I'm always focused on people and their bikes in New York and people in their bikes in LA mm -hmm. and they're very different cultures so I've been photographing that as I'm you know going back and forth over the years and I love seeing the difference between New York bikers and LA bikers it's just a different uh, aesthetic altogether very cool yeah and I, I think um, these personal projects are often easier to work on for a long period of time because there, there is no deadline. You're not trying to get it to the client. You don't have to rush. You know, Skip, what's the benefit of focusing on something for a long time? You know, have you seen any personal growth? Oh, without, without question. Uh, again, with me, with me it's, more about, it's more about writing and dealing with it might be an emotional issue. It might be something that I'm seeing in marketing and photography. Um, but there's there's definitely a benefit because it does 
you actually start, and this sounds really stupid, but you start to become your own inspiration. What you were thinking about a year or two years ago or at the time when you took a particular image and when you start to lay them all out together or you wrote about something in particular, all those things together start to change and you start to realize why you were looking at something in a certain way. Um, I was also sitting here making some notes for for people that are sitting there, like you said it a minute ago, Rich, you've got th this is a new concept for a lot of people. One of the easiest ways to get started is something that that a good buddy did, Brian Palmer, when he was living in Ohio, and now he lives in Japan. Yes. But Brian started one of these Project 365s. Essentially, every morning he's going to take one picture that's very different of something that he wouldn't normally photograph. Now, Brian primarily is a wedding photographer, and when he's not photographing the wedding, he's photographing um, his wife and daughter. But that Project 365, that and I and I got a, I had a good time because at that point, um, I was I had just started my own business. I had met Brian. This is 2009. Um, and he was doing that. He was living in Ohio, and he was finding things around Akron, Ohio, which, for the most part, unless you live in Manhattan or you live on the west coast of of California, you're always sitting there believing that there's nothing to photograph in your city, because those are the two exciting places. And it's like, oh yeah, well, I live in Cleveland. I live in the middle of Ohio. There's nothing here to photograph. Brian had some of the most interesting images. And in fact, when Scott Bourne and I did Going Pro, we actually used one of them uh, in our book. And it was just because of the design elements he had. Um, another one that's motivated me, Dan Steinhardt, who many of us know, who used to be with uh, Epson, has been photographing macro, been doing macro work for, um, for years in, on every trip he took. And he's always got a camera with him. And Dano spent a lot of time on the road. Um, he would do a lot of these macro images of just normal things, and you're sitting there going, what is it? Um, in fact, we used one one of his images years ago on a cover of Rangefinder magazine that was nothing more than two feet crossing a street. And he it, it was just a tight shot of somebody's feet as they walked across the street. So being able to pick a particular style and say, okay, I'm going to have some fun and start experimenting with macro is a really good example because that's when you get into the fun of what is it? And it could be something as simple as a reflection in a water drop, but because of your ability as an artist to tell the story, it becomes really challenging uh, to put all that work together. And the last one I want to remind everybody about, if you've got young kids, um, the younger the better. Put a camera in their hands and then work with them. Let that become another extension of your special project because there is no way to describe what the world looks like, uh, let's say, to a five mm -hmm. or six-year-old. And that's that becomes phenomenal. I, I put a camera in the hands of my grandson, Zachary, when he was about six. We were at a Red Sox game, and he must have taken 20 pictures of the mole on the back of the neck and the guy of the guy in front of us and then said, you know, look, Papa, it looks like a giraffe. Um, that's what was important to him. In fact, I was blown away that the guy didn't feel the heat of the flash the way Zachary was firing away. And then all the peanut shells and all the all the dirt on the ground at his level in the stadium. But being able to give, put a camera in the hands of a child and then be able to help them with that not only challenges you as a parent, but it also challenges you as an artist and a photographer because you really start to see the world differently from somebody that's, you know, three feet high and and six seven years old. Sorry, I didn't mean to go so long, Rich. No, no, it's it's all good. I mean, actually, I I put cameras in my kids' hands all the time. What I have found is it's interesting. My my daughter uh, uses her iPad like crazy, and she'll run around and and take a whole series of things. My son, I gave him a dedicated camera, just a, an indestructible one from Pentax that was, you know, able to be dropped from 30 feet, and I found that it was important in empowering them, I had to give them gear that I didn't care about and didn't need, meaning that I didn't just want to give them a hand-me-down or some equipment that I was standing, oh, don't do this, you know, don't drop it, be careful, because then all of a sudden I was teaching them to be afraid of photography, so I picked up 
you know, a two hundred dollar camera that was indestructible, uh, that you know you'd have to drop from a hundred feet to break. And I put the iPad in a really durable case that's waterproof and could be dropped from a decent height. And and they go to town. And for both of them, it's interesting though the combination of fusion. Um, we've started getting into stop motion animation, my son and I, just using some of the apps on the iPad. There's free stuff available from Lego that you could download, and I, I'm a big fan of iStop Motion from Boinks. And uh, just using your iPad or your iPad tethered to an iPhone, as it's actually as a dedicated separate camera, you could start making these great movies and telling stories. And it's just been fun. I look at some of the films we've done, and it's been great. I'm looking forward to doing more. The end of the school year has been a bit crazy, but. It's amazing um, shooting with kids what it does to my photography. It basically just reminds me to stop taking it so seriously. It, you know, you've talked about that, Matthew. What was your experience with working in the future presidents of, of working with all these kids? What did you get out of it? Oh my God, I got so much out of it. It's, it's funny because I'm thinking about uh, the kids I work with around the country, and they were all intrigued with cameras. Everywhere I went, all the kids wanted to like see the pictures at the end of the shoot. They wanted, you know, some of them wanted to hold the camera which I was like a little scared about that as well. But it's just wonderful seeing them be become interested in photography. So on some people, you know, I'm probably like opening the door for them to become photographers because they're seeing not just a picture on an iPad. They're seeing me with all my gear because I took lights all over the country to light each person. So I'm setting up with my my uh, pro photo strobes on a on a head with a big magma reflector, and I'm lighting each child. So I'm taking my meter out and taking meter readings. So like, what's that? And what's this? And how's it work? And there's no wires. And and they were curious. So it's kind of cool to see that happen and see their um, attention turn away from just being all over the place to being focused mm -hmm. as I took their picture. And at that point, it wasn't just a picture; it was an experience. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of cases, it was the first time when everybody stopped around them and they were focused on them. Here is a stranger coming up with all this crazy, you know, big camera gear, putting lights up and, and making them the focus. It was really cool. Yesterday, I, I want to I share a scene that uh, we saw yesterday. We were, I live in Sarasota, so very calm day. We were at the beach yesterday morning, and as we're out there floating in the ocean, um, a father comes by. I would guess his son was probably four or five years old. He's on a paddle board, and he's got a GoPro in a uh, in a little waterproof housing on one of these little gooseneck suction cup rigs on the tip of his paddle board, photographing his son and pointing up towards him on the paddle boat. And he was telling me that he's got he has a whole series of these because every time he takes the kid out. It's another adventure, and they'll hit a small spot of shallow water near the reef, and they'll get out, and they'll they'll, they'll get off the paddleboard, and snorkel. Um, in fact, he was even set up, even had a uh, a waterproof speaker, had music. His it was kind of pathetic because his uh, his paddleboard was was better equipped with sound, I think, than my car. But he had it all set up, and he's documenting all of this, and that's I think that's also another important facet of, of special projects because as photographers we forget I mean everybody forgets about the impact that that the images have on a client sometimes and when you're when you're doing your own project that impact starts to get translated back to yourself on the memories and the moments that you're capturing it all becomes part of storytelling yes it does yeah yes, it does. good thing hey rich can we switch slightly Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I think I'd love to get into here is when somebody does have a special project, um, it's, it's sort of when you want to do something, what are some of the things you can do with it? And Matthew, I think, left out a couple of important ingredients on, on this current uh, book project because some of the ingredients are about getting other people involved, and it becomes... Um, being able to contact somebody you respect. I mean, he's got he's got Jimmy Carter involved in the forward. He's got Zendaya involved in the forward. He's got some really interesting celebrity kinds of people that can also help you get the message. And I, I think it'd be fun to talk a little bit about 
so when you've got that project and you think you really want to do something with it, you know, Matthew, how did you know that was that w that this was right? I felt it. It's it's funny, you know, because uh, even that question, I I remember this this project came from a failure. Um, I started doing another project in 2007 that I couldn't get off the ground and it died when the recession came but in that project was the birth of this project future American president I had taken four pictures in that project of little kids as an insert as a special addition on the project I was doing so a couple years later my wife says to me, remember that project you were doing years ago? You know, that special section should be its own project. I'm like, duh, yeah, it should. And then I started thinking more, and it developed, and it developed, and it developed. Um, also, my stepson, who's now actually just turned 11, uh, he was one of the first children that I photographed in 2007 for the project. And that picture is on his wall. It's been on his wall since 2007. And he has it by his computer. Even now, last night, I was looking at him playing his, you know, Minecraft. And beside him is that picture from back then. So seeing that picture every day reminded me how important this project was. And it came to life. So with Jimmy Carter and Zendaya, it's, it's kind of wild how that all came together. Because I didn't approach them. It happened during the project with President Jimmy Carter. I'm on my way to Seattle to do a photo shoot for the book in Seattle, Washington. And I flew by myself. We didn't drive on that one. And my wife is beside, is, is back here in L.A. So on the plane, there's a gentleman beside me. He sees me going through my iPad looking at pictures. Make a long story short, we get into a conversation. And he says, I have a friend who should see this project. And at that point, I'm holding it back. I didn't want to show it to anybody. And I'm like, no, I can't. I don't want to let it go yet. I don't want to send it off to anybody that way. He says, no, my friend must see this project. I'm saying, no, no, no. He's like saying, no, my friend should see this. I'm saying, I don't know this guy. And then he tells me who his friend is. Jimmy Carter. And I say, okay. <laughs> I guess you could compromise in that case, right? <laughs> so I sent the project to Mr. Carter, uh, President Jimmy Carter, uh, with a letter explaining what I'm doing and ask him if he would write a letter to the future presidents of the country. And he does. And he sends me a handwritten letter, which is now in the book. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I mean, it's amazing how doors can open up when you're doing projects like this because all of the constraints that you normally have, the time pressures, the, you know, for lack of better words, I, I love my clients except when they muck with it. You know, it's like, you know, ultimately I'm there to serve my clients, but there's times it's like, ah. Oh. And, you know, it's like, okay, well, I'll duplicate the file and that one's for me, or I'm glad they like those, but. This edgier one—that's the one I'm going to keep. So I mean, you know, you can always, you, you can always make your work for you. But sometimes this just removes the barriers that get in our way. There, there is no financial constraint. There is no time constraint. The only constraint is, I guess, getting over your fear. That's very true. That's very, very true. Getting the fear out the way and just going for it. Because, as a matter of fact, fear is a big part of it. When I first started this project, I couldn't conceive of going to every state in the country. I'm like, how can we do that? But I know through experience, it's just the beginning. The, the, you must start. When you have that inspiration for an idea, no matter how crazy it is or how big it is, just start. And then things get out your way and it comes together. It just happens. Because there's there's no way, if I had stopped and, and taken the time to think about what I want to do, that I would have started doing it. I would have said, oh no, I can't. It's, it's too expensive to do. We can't do this. There's no way I can. I don't have the time. Get out the way and let the universe take over and bring it together. And that's what happened. Even with, even with Zendaya, I was in the middle of doing the project and I got a call from a friend who said a parent wanted to meet me. So when I get back to LA, I met with this parent. I had no idea who he was. He ended up being the father of Zendaya who saw pictures I was doing. 
and he said, I want you to photograph my daughter. And at the time, I had no idea who she was. Um, and I came home from that meeting. I told my stepson about this, and he's like, oh, my God, I love her show. I'm like, okay. And then we're going all over America <laughs> taking pictures of other kids, and I'm asking them, and they're all like, oh, my God, I'm her biggest fan. I'm like, okay. <laughs> then I go on her YouTube, and I see she has, like, you know, 20 million hits. I'm like, oh, my God. So... <laughs> It's wild to have seen that come together, and so then I asked her to write the forward for my book, which she gladly did, and I'm elated she did. Um, it's fun now just watching her and her growth because I'm seeing her just propel uh, to the stratosphere. You know, she went from being on um, the Disney show Shake It Up to doing Dancing with the Stars, and uh, last week she was on that show Zapped, playing the movie uh, lead character for Disney. It's great seeing that happen. And also seeing other kids and their connection, because now these other kids around the country feel so connected because they're in a project with Zendaya. Very cool. So uh, as we as we approach these with personal projects, you know, I guess to balance it out, we've we've talked a lot about the positives, but are there any risks or you know anything just to keep an eye out to know? Absolutely. When, okay. So what are some of the things you've learned the hard way? <laughs> oh my God! I can write a whole book on that. I've learned a lot of things the hard way, uh, but when you learn those lessons, you don't forget them. Um, for example, it doesn't matter if your project makes it or not; there will be something positive that comes from it. Um, all projects are hard. There will be a period where it feels like feels like the world is against you and it's not going to happen. But that's the universe testing you to see how badly you want it because it always comes together. It shouldn't be easy, because I believe that, you know, great things come through struggle. And the struggle is part of the, of the, the blessing about it. I mean, traveling to every state in America with a lot of gear is hard. <laughs> I, took, I took my Pro Photo lights everywhere with me, my Pro 7B with me everywhere, because I want to have that consistency in the look of all the images. From I had no idea if it was going to be overcast or rainy or cloudy or, or blue sky. I had no idea where I'd go, but I knew I'd have all of that at some point. But I wanted the images to have that same feeling, so I lit everything so it has that same feeling from the first state to the last state. And I'm glad I had that, that feeling throughout, that thread throughout the project. Very cool. Very cool. Skip, how about for you? Anything that you've seen, you know, as you've worked with other folks? Absolutely. Yeah, I think one of the things that's really important, and this is a rut people get into, and I think it comes out of, of, uh, I, I think it comes out of fear, and I hate to call it fear of failing, um, because I really don't believe in failure. You're always going to learn something. But the challenge is that you have to remember, you don't have to be a solo act when, when you get to that point where you're working on this project and you're really starting to formulate an idea of what it might be, this is where you bring in your, bring in your friends. And I know I wasn't the only one that, that was on Matthew's call list. And he'd send me something to look at, and I'd look at it, and I'd throw my two cents worth, uh, my two cents back to him on, well, I don't know, but you, did you think about doing it this way? The challenge we all have is that we're all too close to our own business. Absolutely. And yeah, and we don't see it the same way. And yet, you know, when somebody asks me to look at something, um, truthfully, it's it's you're being it's that moment in time you're allowed to be a Monday morning quarterback. You're allowed to say, "Gee, I don't know why do why did you word it this way, or why did you photograph it this way, or have you thought about?" you know doing it a different way and one of the things that I love and I've seen this on other projects and other things Matthew has done um, he follow absolutely follows his own heart but he's never been afraid to say to friends in his network what do you think of this and then listen and then pull out what makes sense to him and what doesn't make sense to him and it helps make the project stronger and I think where some people um, fail be, is simply where it, where it fails to become a reality is simply because they get caught up in the fear, and they don't want to they don't want to talk about it. They're they're afraid of the criticism. But this goes back to an even bigger point: if in your network, if in the inner core of your network, and everybody for the most part 
only has at max five to ten people in that very inner circle. That's in true. that group, if you have surrounded yourself with positive people, with people that believe in dreaming, uh, Matthew's tagline on everything, everything he's ever written in public always finishes with the line, always dream big. And I think if you surround yourself with people that share a lot of that same philosophy, you can say, you know, hey, tell me what you think. I mean, Rich, you've helped me on a whole bunch of different things um, over the few years we've known each other. And I know you've got a circle of close friends that you'll bounce things off of. And I think that's an important part of taking a project. And when you get to that point where you want it to be more than just your own personal project, that's when you want to bring in some people in your network. And you don't have to, like I said, you don't have to fly solo. Well, one of the things that I sometimes do, and uh, perhaps this is a, a deep, dark secret, but maybe people can use it to their advantage, is sometimes I'll share things without my name attached, meaning, um, you know, invariably, in my case, you know, my main job is to do technical training and to help people learn more about their software and their tools. Um, you know, I also have a, you know, my other job is, you know, to create pieces for clients. And so a lot of times, you know, I'm part of a collaborative process at Red Pixel and we produce things, but we will often publish things in different ways. And meaning like when I'm doing a lot of personal projects, sometimes I'll just release things under a fake name or I'll have a fake gallery and I'll put it out to a, a website just to let people react or comment knowing that they're reacting and commenting to the work and not to any of the baggage that my name may or may not bring to things. And that's very liberating. I, I you know, the thing is, is that you can't get hung up on what does the interweb say because uh, one of the things I've definitely found is there's, there's no making 80% of the people on the internet happy. They're either already happy and they're never going to change or they are just pissed off and grumpy. <laughs> Only about 20% of people genuinely have reactions and everyone else just continues the mood that they're having. And so I sometimes find it's more useful to just throw something out without my name attached and to just read through and treat it as like a blind taste test. Like what do people think? Have either of you done anonymous feedback, or you know how do you how do you distance yourself from the emotional response of wanting to make everybody happy when you put something out there? Because sometimes your friends won't give you genuine criticism, or when they do, it hurts more than it should. Well, oh, I wow. I'll, I'll start out on that one. I'm I'm an administrator on a Facebook forum with with almost nineteen thousand members. And one of the things that happens on Facebook all the time is somebody that puts up somebody puts up an image, and there's always one knucklehead out there that that never learned how to communicate and just be nice. You know that old line of your grandmother's of if right. you don't have anything nice to say, shut up. <laughs> um, and somebody will shred the image, and the next thing you know, there's a battle that goes on. I can't tell you how many times I have to remind people of Dean Collins' old line of beauty is in the eye of the checkbook holder. It doesn't matter um, if if you if you love somebody else's image or not or the idea. What matters is that they liked it or that their client really liked it, and that's one of the challenges that I see most often. And and somebody puts it out. I have not posted. Um, I don't think I posted anything um, anonymous anonymously. Although every now and then there is an issue that I believe in that I'll put out there. Um, as an objective third party who said to me something just to get people's feedback. And it's interesting because a lot of times we draw the wrong assumptions because we haven't gone outside our own little circle. How about you, Matthew? Have you, have you stumbled on that? Well, I've never posted in that way, but I, I love the idea of that and uh, because it, it does probably feel very liberating mm -hmm. to, to you know, share your work in that way. Without your name attached and all the stigma that goes behind it, I would love I would love that. Uh, one thing I do that very few people know is um, I shoot for my eight by ten a lot, and that stuff is the work I shoot for my Deardorf is not uh, my traditional work. Um, it's landscapes, and and I have I've got seventy sheets of black and white triex, you know, sitting that I want to expose expose 
very soon at some point over the years. I want to sh also shoot like another 200 sheets of 8x10 color that I want to, you know, um, hopefully make some beautiful images of. But that stuff, you know, I don't show that. But, I, but I'd like to eventually one day, maybe 20 years from now, we'll see. Oh, my uh, God. Right now, we could be three <laughs> of only 20 people in the world that remember what Tri-X was. Now, exactly. don't wait, don't wait too long. 8 by 10. Don't wait. Yeah. <laughs> 8 by 10, what is that? I uh, know. I've got 8 oh. by 10 of Tri-X, and that's beautiful right. stuff. But here's an interesting thing about shooting that way. Um, you don't get any retakes. No. You can't. You can't. You can't look at that image and go, "Oh, great!" I mean, it's it. <laughs> it it is un, it is unforgiving. It's shooting in you know eight by ten sheet film. I, I gotta oh. tell you for a second. Um, I shot eight by ten in China last year when I was shooting all these directors, and people have a different respect when they see you pull out an eight by ten camera. It's a very different aesthetic. <laughs> very cool. Oh, very cool. Well. As we, we, we've got a couple of minutes left, I just wanted to throw out a, a few more things, and I'd like to revisit your project as well, Matthew, so people can look up more on the Indiegogo site and, and start to see the book as well. Uh, one of the things I think that people struggle with with personal projects is determining the value to themselves, making sure that they actually make time for it. And you know, I think maybe if we could each just share a couple of core benefits of what we get out of it. You know, for me, the benefit of a personal project is it gets me out of my rut. It lets me try something different and it removes a lot of pressure because I could decide if anybody sees it. It could be just for me. Um, one of the things I've recently started doing is I've been uh, revisiting my entire photography collection, meaning I tossed in the uh, Mosaic app and their plugin for Lightroom and I've just said push all of my images to my iPad, everything, and it basically is a low quality preview and it streams. And I'm going through and I'm 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 applying what Terry White would you know sometimes do of like you know actually purging some things. But I'm revisiting images that for one reason or the other didn't make the cut. Random things from a trip, abstract things, things that I look at and I go, I like this. And then I'm revisiting it and I'm just delving into new ways of post-processing or what would happen if I made that black and white? What happens if I tried merging some exp multiple exposures together with blending modes? And I'm having a lot of fun because it's almost like, I, I don't want to say I'm rolling the dice and just taking any image, but I'm not going in with any logic. I'm just like browsing, browsing, much like you would randomly stroll, scroll through a Twitter stream. And if something catches my eye, I stop. And then I decide if I want to do something with it. And it's just been interesting because... Um, shoots that I didn't feel great about at the time sometimes have some gems left over that were just sitting in a folder on a hard drive somewhere. Very often they do. Yeah. And so how about for you, Matthew? Anything that, you know, any things that you found or, or advice you can give folks who are just feeling a little bit stuck or don't know where to start? Yes, indeed. You know, with, with your work, sometimes we see our own ourselves in the eyes of our clients. And clients can put you in a box. Um, the personal projects pull you out of that box. They let you explore. And I love that because people see me as doing one specific thing, uh, you know, celebrity, beauty. But my projects give me a chance to really express myself in a new way and show what I care about, not what's going to get me work commercially. And I love that. So your projects should be something that means something to you, that touches you in some way because that's the core of your being. And when you're showing work like that, people feel it and they react to it. Very cool. Very cool. And Skip, anything you want to add before we let Matthew tell us about his project? Yeah, real quick. I mean, I, 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 I have shot a little bit of everything um, for a lot of years. In fact, I have the biggest collection of underexposed underwater images on <laughs> planet Earth that I just couldn't get the hang of it as I took a Hasselblad and an underwater housing on dive trip after dive trip. But I think one of the things that it does, when I go back and look at some of my older images, which are, in this case, the profile is mostly what you'd expect to see uh, on the desktop of a serious hobbyist. It's families, it's vacations, it's every now and then being with 
with somebody in the industry who is a working pro and being at their workshop and experimenting. And I think one of the things that it also helps you do is maintain that pride at being part of the photographic industry and being a photographer and an artist. And it's so easy for that pride to get trampled on and just disappear into the woodwork when you're, you're fighting the economy or you're fighting technology or you're fighting um, just making this week's payroll or to pay the bills because things aren't going the way they normally have gone. And I remember listening to, to Joe McNally speak a couple of years ago and he was very open about some of the times in his life where you know business was just slow but by by staying focused and continue to photograph no matter what he might have had as an assignment or just something he wanted to do it helped maintain that 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 pride and keep his skills sharp and that's one of the things that I think can disappear because every photographer is also a business person and special projects help you separate the business from the passion and help you stay focused on the passion. Very cool. Well, exactly. Matthew, why don't you tell folks a little bit more about your latest personal project and where they can find info and I'll also put the link into the blog post that goes with this and I'll put it into the YouTube description as well so people can click over and find it but tell them a little bit about the project as well as how you're inviting people to get involved in the community so they can be a part of it. Sounds good. Yes, so this is a chance for you to really not only uh, support a great project, but inspire your own child or a child that's special to you, uh, a nephew, a niece, a grandchild, your own child. This project is meant to empower and inspire children all over the country. Today, it's live on Indiegogo under the name Your Child on the Cover because I want to put your child on the cover of the brand new book, Future American President and inspire your child and every child in the country. And this week, if you support the project with a um, commitment of $25 or more, I will give for free all the videos in my store collection. There's 10 total. Um, that's a $160 value. I'm giving them all away for free for everybody who goes and supports this week based off of this. That's that's extremely generous of you, and so by helping bring this project to life, not only are you you know helping out the kids and helping out really get this project out there, but you are also then putting in people's hands additional knowledge to spurn them to new projects. Absolutely, and even more because a portion of every sale of the book or this uh, Indiegogo uh, uh, project goes toward. Boys and Girls Clubs of America as well. The Boys and Girls Clubs found out about my project a year into it and helped me find children all over the country. They, they love the project, they love the, the idea of it, they love the message, and they want to get involved. And they helped me find children everywhere. It was very important for me to be inclusive of children um, around the country, of every ethnic background, also uh, children who are visually disabled and who you may not know are disabled uh, with autism or whatever. So I have children in the book who, who may not normally be featured in a project like this. And I'm very happy about that, to be able to show children of all backgrounds um, doing something positive and being inspiring for other children. Well, that's very, very cool. Matthew, where can people, I put the URL up, we'll put it in the description, and you mentioned it's on Indiegogo. How about your own website? I'm sure you've got some links off of that. Tell folks where to find your site and also Absolutely. where they can enjoy some of your photography. Yes, my site is MatthewJordanSmith.com, and I also have a store, which is PhotographyHelpStore.com, where you'll find all those videos that I'm giving away for free. Very cool, very cool. Skip, why don't you wrap us up this week, and uh, we'll go on home. All right. You'll find me at Skip Cohen on Twitter and SkipCohenUniversity.com and Skip Cohen on Facebook. And, Matthew, this has just been a lot of, a lot of great comments and ideas for people. And, Rich, where do they find you? 
Uh, you can join me over at photofocus.com. There's new stories there every day from a great team of folks. And uh, my personal site is richardharrington.com. If you'd like to just check out some of my things, and I'm out there in lots and lots of places. Not too hard to find. Well, thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. Matthew, big thanks as well for coming out today. Thank you. I'm enjoyed to be here. Thank you guys so much. I can talk about this forever. All right. Well, excellent, guys. I go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no time for that. Tonight, maybe. Excellent. Well, Matthew, thank you again, and Skip, good as always. We'll be back next month with another episode. And remember, folks, if you missed the whole Hangout, it is recorded, so you can rewatch it on YouTube, and we'll also be posting it to Skip Cohen University and photofocus.com so you can share it with others. Thanks for watching, everybody.